Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. And as I already promised, this week is X-ray week. So I hope you're really thrilled for this X-ray week as I am because we're going to be learning a lot about medical imaging. Often there are so many students that are on the wards that have no idea where they're given X-rays, what they are looking at, what they should be looking at, what looks normal and what looks abnormal. So which is why I came up with this series of review lecture videos to help students understand on how to read chest x-rays, how to read abdominal x-rays, how to read skull x-rays, and pretty much any other x-ray of the body. So if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend that it's x-ray week, grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Over the series and over this week we shall be looking mainly at chest x-rays so that's what we shall start with and later on on the channel subsequently we shall then move on to abdominal x-rays look at skull x-rays and then x-rays of other long bones so in this review lecture video we're going to be pretty much looking at introduction to x-ray principles how you should understand why x-rays look the way they do and why certain structures appear like that on the x-ray. Then of course we'll later move on to how to read a chest x-ray. We'll look at the principles of chest, chest x-ray interpretation. We'll look at the technical qualities of a chest x-ray. So remember that x-rays are just simply a form of electromagnetic radiation and this electromagnetic radiation is going to be passing through the human body and it's going to produce a picture or an image of the internal structures on a film. So remember that this electromagnetic waves are going to be carried by high energy protons so meaning that they're going to be penetrating into the tissues. I want you to keep this in mind because often people have this misconception that the x-ray film is actually going to start off as a dark piece of paper then it becomes white but it's obviously the other way around it starts off as a white piece of paper then becomes dark so there are some common terms that are going to be used to denote chest x-rays as well as to denote abdominal x-rays so we use cxr to denote chest x-ray and we use axr to denote abdominal x-rays. So remember that these abdominal as well as chest x-rays are going to be used in the evaluation of many diseases affecting the chest, are going to be used in the evaluation of diseases affecting the breast, are going to be used in the evaluation of diseases affecting the bones as well as the abdomen. So remember that these x-rays are just simply a beam of these high energy protons that are going to be passing through the human body. Some of them are going to be absorbed by the human body because the human body has some dense structures, like for example, bones, like for example, other dense tissues, they can absorb a lot of these x-rays. While as other structures like the lungs, which are only going to be containing air, are not going to be absorbing a lot of these x-rays. So they allow a lot of these x-rays to pass through. So you can think of this absorption quote-unquote of the x-rays as attenuation of the beam because you weaken the beam that's going to reach the film. So the film is going to be starting off as white and the rule of thumb is this, the more x-rays that are exposed to this film, the darker it will become. So it means that if the structure that is in between the x-ray beam and the film absorbed a lot of these x-rays, then the ultimate picture that you're going to be getting there is going to be very bright, which is why bones are going to be appearing bright or tissues that have a high density or tissues that have a high atomic number, they're going to be appearing much lighter because they attenuate the beam even more. They weaken the beam. Not a lot of x-rays are going to be passing through. So tissues like bones, tissues like solid organs are going to be appearing brighter on the x-ray and so they're going to be light gray or they could be white on the x-ray then the tissues that are going to be attenuating less meaning that they'll allow a lot of x-rays to pass through it means that a lot of x-rays are going to be reaching the film and they're going to make this uh, film appear much darker which is why the lungs that only have air allow a lot of x-rays to pass through that's why the lungs appear dark and x-ray air on x-ray is going to be appearing dark so this structure is going to be appearing dark so structures of a lesser density are going to be appearing darker on the x-ray. So it means that principally you have pretty much five different densities or quote unquote five different colors that you can see on the x-ray. So you have air or gas that's going to be appearing black which is denoted by number one here. So the lungs which have air in them, the bowel if they have air in it, the stomach which has air in it is going to be appearing 
dark. So as we can see here on this radiograph that is depicted on the right side of your screen, the air surrounding this leg, this is of course an x-ray of the lower limb, is going to be appearing dark. Then we move on to number two, which is fat. Remember, fat is going to attenuate some x-rays, but not to a very large extent. So it means that fat or even subcutaneous tissue, even retroperitoneal fat, is going to be appearing dark gray, what is depicted by the arrows or what is depicted by number two over here. The soft tissues will not absorb a lot of x-rays. Even water will not absorb a lot of x-rays, so it's going to be appearing light gray. So solid organs, the heart. The, um, I mean, they're going to attenuate a lot of x-rays, rather. So they won't allow a lot of x-rays to pass through. So the heart, solid organs, the blood vessels, the muscles, the fluid-filled organs, these, like the bladder, these are going to be attenuating a lot of x-rays, so they're going to be appearing this light gray, which, which is depicted by number three over here. Then the bone is very dense, so it won't be allowing a lot of x-rays to pass through. So it's going to be giving you an off-white kind of color, as you can see here. Number four here is depicting the bone, which is giving you an off-white kind of color. Then, of course, contrast metals are going to be bright white. So this contrast metal here, which is shown here, as five bright white much brighter than the bone so these are the five general principles that you're going to be seeing on the x-ray dark because they are allowing a lot of x-rays through like for example air or gas dark gray meaning they are attenuating some x-rays but still the large majority of the x-rays are passing through like for example in fat uh, light gray meaning that they are attenuating much more x-rays and they are not allowing so much x-rays bone attenuating even more x-rays not allowing a lot of x-rays to pass through so it's going to be off-white and then of contrast metal which almost doesn't allow pretty much any um, x-rays through so it attenuates most of the x-rays and they don't actually reach the film so it gives you this bright white color so what are some of these factors that are going to be associated uh, or are going to be affecting the brightness of an x-ray? Like I already told you, the density or the atomic number of the tissue. So if a tissue is low, low density, it means that it's going to be penetrated by more x-rays and it's going to be producing a film that's going to be appearing darker. And the term when we see that a structure on an x-ray is appearing darker than it's supposed to be or much darker, you refer to that as radiolucent because it's allowing a lot of x-rays to pass through. Then higher density tissues are not going to be penetrated by a lot of x-rays, so it means that they're going to be appearing light on x-ray. And the fact that they're not up are going to be penetrated by a lot of x-rays, you refer to these uh, appearance as radio opaque. So it means it's not allowing a lot of x-rays through. And then of course, another thing is the thickness. So the thicker the structure, the brighter it is going to be on x-ray because it's attenuating a lot of x-rays. Then of course, the third factor that's going to be affecting the brightness of the shadow on the x-ray is obviously the duration of exposure. So if you expose this to a lot of x-rays, it gives um, a, long, a lot of time for this x-ray to penetrate through the tissue. So it means that the image is going to appear too dark. If you have a short exposure, meaning that there's not enough exposure for the x-rays to actually meet the film, it means that the film will remain bright, remain light. So they keep these principles in mind because when I show you a normal x-ray, then you understand why certain structures are appearing the way they are on the x-ray. So remember that chest x-rays are very commonly ordered in the practice. And if you are already rotating on your um, wards, if you are in any other department, be it pediatrics, be it surgery, be it internal medicine, Obs and guy, not so much, but in some cases, we may even order for some x-rays in some cases. So you may have seen that chest x-rays are ordered almost on a daily basis. And we order chest x-rays for various reasons. It could be for respiratory disease. Like, for example, if a patient presents you with cough, if they're producing sputum, if they are coughing out blood, which is referred to as hemoptysis, if there's any difficulties in breathing, which is dyspnea, if there's any chest pains, and even other systemic manifestations that may point towards tuberculosis, like, for example, fever, weight loss, night sweats, which may also indicate some malignancies. But of course, you should remember that we want to treat the patient and you want to tailor your management to the patient and not really the investigations, meaning that you should marry what you see on your investigations with what you get on your history and what you get on your physical examination, especially when you auscultate the chest. So the investigations are just simply helping you 
to confirm your already suspicion that's there on your history and your physical examination. So it means that your history and physical examination must point you towards the investigations that you want to order. And remember that for patients that come in with respiratory symptoms and some cardiovascular symptoms, we order chest x-rays for virtually all of them. So some of the indications why we can order for chest x-rays is if we want to evaluate certain symptoms, such as shortness of breath, chest pains, fevers, even unexplained weight loss. If you want to evaluate certain physical signs, such as hypoxemia, such as abnormal pulmonary examination findings, if you want to evaluate whether you've placed a central line or an NGT or an endotracheal tube in the right place, you can order for a chest x-ray or you should order for a chest x-ray rather. If you're screening for conditions such as pneumonia after or pneumothorax rather, after a lung biopsy, even after trauma, even after central line placement, or even pacemaker placement, you want to order for a chest x-ray. If you're evaluating for a pacemaker lead fracture, you want to order for a chest x-ray. Then if you want to make a diagnosis of certain conditions such as chest pathologies, like for example, pneumonias, the chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, pleural effusions, of which we shall cover on the channel, and if you have some heart pathologies like heart failure, of course, you want to order for a chest x-ray. So here is a normal chest x-ray and what it looks like. So as we can see here, we can apply the general principles that we learned uh, earlier on. We see that the air here is appearing dark. Even the lungs here that have air are appearing dark. The solid structures are going to be appearing gray. Over here, you can see the heart. You can see these lines, which are pretty much blood vessels that are appearing light because they have blood in them. They have water in them. The stomach, which is over here, we can see underneath the left side of the diaphragm here because of the air that's in the stomach. You refer to this as the gastric bubble. And then, of course, we can see that the bones here are off-white. And then, of course, the marker here is completely uh, bright white. Okay? So this is a normal chest x-ray. We shall be able to understand and read this systematically by the end of these review lecture videos. So principles before we actually start on chest x-ray interpretation, you have to consider two things. You have to consider what projection you're looking at. First of all, you should consider which structure am I x-raying. This is an x-ray of a skull. This is an x-ray of the chest. This is an x-ray of the abdomen. This is an x-ray of the knee. What are you looking at? Which anatomical site are you looking at? And then what projection are you looking at? Meaning that in which directions were the x-rays traveling? Because this means are different things in different scenarios. Like for example, if you're dealing with chest x-rays, there are some projections that you can order that are much more superior to the other. We shall talk about them shortly. Then of course, you should assess the technical quality of this x-ray because if this x-ray is not taken very well, then it means that it can affect how you're going to make a diagnosis based on this x-ray. You may either miss certain things or you may over-diagnose certain things and you shall get to learn that by the end of this review lecture. So with the chest x-rays, generally we have three important projections. Of the three, the posterior anterior is the much more common projection that we order almost on a daily basis. Then you have an anteroposterior uh, projection and you have a lateral projection. What do I mean by posterior projection? Let me just show you a dark screen here so that I can jot a few things down and you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So suppose you have this as your x-ray beam. Okay, so this is maybe the x-ray that is sending out a beam in this direction, like so. So it's sending out the beam in this direction. So if the person, let's say this is a person here that's getting an x-ray, pardon my, my art, I know it is very, very awesome. So let's say this is a person that's facing this side. It's facing, the, the person is facing the beam. And let's say the film is on this side of the patient. So this these x-rays that are entering in the body are going to be entering from an anterior perspective and going towards a posterior perspective. So you refer to this projection that you're going to be getting or the picture that you're going to be getting on the x-ray as an anterior posterior or an anteroposterior projection. So it means that the x-rays are traveling from the anterior side to the posterior side. And of course, the opposite is true. If the x-rays were to be moving in this direction from the posterior side to the anterior side, you would refer to that as a posterior anterior direction. If they're moving from side to side, you refer to that as a lateral. So of the three projections, the posterior and the posterior anterior is by far the most superior one compared to the anterior posterior. And I shall explain why it is so. So let's get back to the slides. So we have a posterior anterior, 
we have an anterior posterior and we have a lateral projection. So often we use two radiographic views, that's the PA and the lateral, and we use this to evaluate some certain chest conditions. There are some exceptions though where we can just order for a PA chest x-ray. Like for example, in infants and children, a PA chest x-ray will be sufficient enough. If you're screening for examinations, like for example, for driving medicals or insurance forms, or even for uh, terms of immigration, a PHS x-ray would just be enough. If you're following up certain conditions, like for example, if a patient is being treated for pneumonia with antibiotics, you can just order for a PHS x-ray to see if this is resolving. If there's metastasis, that's following chemotherapy or pneumothorax, that's following a drainage remote uh, or you, an intercostal drainage, then you can order for a PHS x-ray. It would be sufficient enough. And remember, whenever someone is taking a chest x-ray, it should normally be taken in an erect position, unless if the individual is bedridden, that's why they can be take, it could be taken in a supine position. But ideally, it should be taken in an erect position. Why are we doing this? Number one, to ensure that there's some anatomical positioning of almost all the tissues in the body. And if there's any air, air is going to tend to rise and fluid is going to tend to settle. So that's why you want to take this x-ray in an erect position. And of course, it should be taken at a distance of about 150 to 200 centimeters. But of course, that's for the radiologist to know. So we'll begin with our posterior anterior uh, erect uh, x-ray. So remember this patient is positioned standing and his back or oh, his anterior chest wall is facing the x-rays, the x-ray film. And then the posterior is facing the x-ray. So it means that the x-ray tube or the x-rays are going to be entering the patient from the back of the patient to the front. So they're going to be getting in from a posterior aspect going towards an anterior aspect. So it's going to be a posterior anterior uh, x-ray. Now, the reason why we want to do a PA x-ray is because we want to have an accurate measurement or an accurate assessment of the cardiac size. Now, I'll explain this by using analogy with everyday life. I'm sure each of you that are watching these videos have used the projector before. The one that they use in the cinema, the one that you use probably in your class or wherever it may be. So what would happen if you get the projector and put it closer to the board? Would the image that's seen on the board be smaller or would it be larger? If your answer was that the image will be smaller, you're indeed correct. If it was larger, then you're not making sense. So if you take your projector and you put it towards the wall or towards the board, the image becomes smaller. So it becomes almost like the actual size. Okay. Now, if you take the projector far away from the board, the size of the screen begins to increase. The size of the image begins to increase. That's why at the cinema, the projector is a distance from the film so that they can make the screen as big as possible. That's just basic common sense or basic logic. So the same principle is happening with the x-rays. So the size of the heart, because the heart is in the anterior aspect of the chest or much closer to the anterior aspect of the chest, if it's closer to the film, then the heart size is going to be most likely the same as the anatomical size inside the body. So there's going to be less of the magnification of the size of the heart. If you get up an AP x-ray, it means that the heart is far away from the film because the film is on the posterior aspect. So there will be some magnification and even the size of the heart may be falsely enlarged. So the heart may appear larger than it's supposed to be. The other reason why we can order for a posterior anterior chest x-ray is because you can actually rotate the scapula in a special way and remove them out of the lung fields. Because if the scapula are on the lung field, sometimes they may be confused for some pulmonary pathologies. The reason why we want to do an erect film is because we want to have a, a correct physiological representation of the blood, the mediastinum, and the lungs, like I already told you. If you have a, a person in a supine position, you may have uh, the mediastinal vessels, even the upper lobes may be distended, so it may lead to misinterpretation of the x-ray, so it may not be in anatomical uh, in the normal anatomical and physiological representation. And then, of course, uh, if we want to have a, a normal mediastinum, it may look abnormal if the patient is laying down. So which is why one of the reasons why we order an x-ray when they are erect. The other reason is because the gases are going to be moving upwards. So if this person has a pneumothorax, the gas will rise because air has a much lesser density than water. And of course, fluids will pass down, like, for example, with the pleural effusions, and they'll become much more obvious for you to see. So here's an example of a posterior anterior x-ray, which is a normal x-ray that I've already showed you. 
So moving on to the lateral x-ray. So we can order a lateral x-ray for many reasons. One of the reasons is if we want to further view the lungs. So if you want to get a 3D aspect or a 3D view of a certain lesion, like for example, in the areas that are obscured, especially on the posterior anterior x-ray, like for example, the posterior segments of the lower lobes, you can't really see them very well on the PA chest x-ray. Then if also the areas that are behind the hyla, you can't really see them very well. The left lower lobe, which lies behind the heart on the posterior anterior x-ray, you can't really see that. So you'd want to order an, a lateral x-ray. Then of course, for further assessment of the cardiac configuration, cardiac configuration, then also further assessment and anatomical localization of certain lesions or, or whatever you may suspect on your PHS x-ray. And of course, if you want to find out a pleural effusion, pleural effusion can be easily found on a lateral x-ray than it can be found on a PA x-ray. And of course, if you want to view the thoracic spine very well, then a lateral x-ray would be your guy. So here's an example of the lateral x-ray. You could ignore the markings for now. This is just simply to tell you that this is the humerus over there. This is the trachea. This is the right hilum. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. This is, of course, the inferior vena cava. This is the left atrium over there. Okay. Then this, of course, is a lateral x-ray. As we can see, we can visualize the thoracic vertebra here very, very well. Then moving on to anterior posterior or a supine x-ray. So this is a film that's going to be, of course, placed behind the patient. And the x-ray beam is going to be moving from the front uh, of the patient and it's going to be moving towards the back. So it's going to be entering in an anterior aspect. It's going to be leaving in a posterior aspect. So the reasons why we can actually order for a uh, uh, an AP or an anterior posterior supine x-ray or for example in patients that are acutely ill in patients that are traumatized or they are too sick for them to stand in patients that are in ICU even in patients that are in coronary care units then we can order for an AP chest x-ray so for the bedridden patients you can order for an AP chest x-ray and then of course uh, this AP chest x-ray is going to be having some mediastinal even some heart enlargement so the mediastinum and the heart are going to be appearing much wider than they supposed to be and there's going to be some features of venous distension so please take note of that and then of course the ap x-rays are much more inferior in quality to the pa x-rays so here is an example of an ap x-ray so as we can see here the heart here appears much larger even generally the entire mediastinum here appears much much larger than it was in the posterior anterior uh, x-ray so other projections that we may actually order for include things like a decubitus film where the patient is going to be lying on the side. And of course, this is going to be used occasionally in patients who are too ill to stand, in patients with pleural effusions, in patients with pneumothorax. And you are suspecting these, but you can't really diagnose them on an AP. So you can do a decubitus film where the patient lays on their side. Sometimes you may take an oblique film, which helps in assessing rib lesions. It helps in pneumothoraces. It also helps in to displace, um, to display some other chest wall pathologies. So here's an example of a lateral decubitus x-ray film over here. And of course, this looks like it was uh, taken in a child. So when it comes to the second part now, technical assessment of the x-ray film, you should always assess. So the first thing that you're going to be looking at is what type of a projection this x-ray is, which is what I've told you about. Is it a PA? Is it an AP? Is it a lateral? Okay. Is it a uh, supine? Is it erect? Is it a decubitus uh, type of x-ray? Then the next thing that you're going to be assessing is, of course, the technical quality of this x-ray. Because if this x-ray is not taken well, if this x-ray doesn't have good quality, you may misdiagnose certain important things. So there are three factors that we're going to be assessing when we're looking at the technical quality of this x-ray. The first thing that we're going to be assessing is, of course, rotation of the patient. So the second thing that we're going to be assessing is, of course, if this x-ray is taken on adequate inspiration or if there's inadequate inspiration. The third thing is if there is inadequate uh, in, in penetration or if there is a suboptimal penetration. So beginning with rotation of the patient. So remember that the patient can actually rotate in three axes. And this is not really a standardized thing and it's not there in the textbook. So it's just a way of me 
helping you understand. So as we can see here, you have an x-axis where the patient twists in this direction, or you can have an y-axis rotation where the patient twists in that direction, or you can have a z-axis where the patient twists in that direction relative to the x-ray beam that is entering there. So we'll begin with an x-axis rotation, which is obviously the easiest thing to spot on the x-ray. And this is the one that actually has the least impact on the technical quality of the x-ray. The only thing that the patient is going to look like is it's going to appear like as if the, the patient here appears crooked on the film. So as you can see here, it appears like as if the patient is crooked on the x-ray film. The consequences of this is because you're not going to be able to visualize the costophrenic angles very well. The costophrenic angles are just this angle that is created by the lateral wall of the chest and the diaphragm. So this angle here is known as the costophrenic angle. So you may not be able to visualize it properly here. The gastric bubble also, which is found here on the left side, may also not be visualized very well. That's one of the consequences of x-axis rotation. Then the patient can also rotate on the y-axis in this direction. Over here, so we talked about x-axis, the patient is going to be appearing crooked. They can also rotate on the y-axis over there. So if they rotate on the y-axis, it means that the patient is going to be rotated relative to uh, the film, the x-ray film, as well as the x-ray beam. So it means that the patient is not longer going to be at a perpendicular distance towards the x-ray film. I'll show you the picture of this and it will make much more sense. So it will mean that the x-rays are now entering into the body at an angle. Okay, they're not really entering at 90 degrees like they sh should normally uh, enter. So what you're going to be creating or the film that you're going to be creating when you have this y-axis rotation is, is noted as a lodotic view. And one of the things that is going to see is that you're going to be able now to see the lung apices. The clavicles are going to appear like as if they are much higher than the apices of the lungs. You won't be able to see the lung bases. You won't be able to appreciate the costophrenic angles. The cardiac shadow or the cardiac silhouette is going to be distorted. And of course, the lung volumes may appear uh, much less than they normally should. So normally, this is what's supposed to ha happen. A relationship between the clavicle and the apex of the lungs. So we have these x-rays that are supposed to be entering the body at 90 degrees. So you have this as a clavicle here and you have this x-ray beam that's going to come and hit the clavicle and be attenuated. Another one is going to come above the clavicle and pass through such that you get this normal presentation. So this is a normal AP view of how it's going to appear. So you see that these apices of the lungs, you can see them above the clavicles. You can visualize the bases of the lungs very well. You can also visualize the costophrenic angles very well. But what happens if this person here rotates in the y-axis? Now, it will appear like as if the x-rays are entering into the film at a certain angle. So it means that the clavicles here are going to be visualized like as if they are above the uh, apex of the lungs. So you, what you have created here is what is known as a lodotic view. So you will see that the apices can be seen here. You see that the mediastinum here is distorted. The lungs appear much smaller than they are supposed to be. And they appear and the um, Daphra also cannot really be appreciated. The costophrenic angles also cannot really be appreciated. So those are the consequences that you get when this patient rotates in the Y axis. Then this patient can rotate in the Z axis. So if this patient rotates in the Z axis, what's going to be happening is that the distance now that's going to be between the spinous process in the midline to the medial ends of the clavicle will not be equal because this distance is supposed to be equal to ensure that this patient is well centered on the x-ray. So if this patient is rotated along the z-axis, it will mean that the spinous processes can either move closer to one side of the medial end of the clavicle. And the consequences of this is the size, even the shape of the cardiac silhouette, the shape of the mediastinum, even the hilum is going to be appearing distorted. So here's an example of what I, I, I mean. So if this person here, the x-ray beam is entering from a posterior to anterior aspect, you have the x-ray film here and you have the x-rays entering there, you see that the distance between the spinous process and the medial ends of the clavicle should be equal. So if we measure this distance from here to here and we measure this distance from here to here, this distance should be equal. So if the person rotates in the z-axis, we'll see that this spinous process would have moved much, much closer to this clavicle end here. So it will appear like this. So this distance will be much shorter than this distance, which appears longer. That's when a patient rotates in the z axis. So the other thing that is very important when you're taking your x-ray is, of course, 
inspiration. Remember that x-rays must be taken on full inspiration. And how will we know that this x-ray is taken on full inspiration? You should be able to count the ribs. So you should have about 9 to 10 posterior ribs that should be visible. There should be about 6 to 7 anterior ribs that are visible. And of course, the seventh rib should be piercing the diaphragm. And if we take an, an x-ray with inadequate inspiration, it means that the lungs are going to be appearing much smaller than they are supposed to be. Some lung markings may be falsely prominent. So you may have a false appearance of edema, a pulmonary edema. The cardiac silhouette, of course, in the mediastinum is going to be appearing much larger than it's supposed to be. So let me just zoom this here on your right so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. So the posterior ribs are the ones that you can easily see here. So if we count them, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So they should be about nine to ten posterior ribs. Then the anterior ribs are the ones that are coming in this direction. If you're not able to see them on this image, I think they might they will be much more clearer on the next image. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see that the seventh rib here is piercing the diaphragm. So it means that these x-rays are taken on full inspiration. So the consequences of you taking an x-ray on inadequate inspiration, as we can see here, we can only count eight posterior ribs, but this is the same patient with uh, full inspiration. As we can see here, the lung appears much smaller than it's supposed to be. The mediastinum appears much larger than it's supposed to be. The lung markings here are more prominent than they're supposed to be, which is why we should always take the x-ray on full inspiration. And take note also of this um, breast tissue here. So don't confuse this and ask what this is. This is just simply because this was taken in a woman. So this is an x-ray of a woman. So the, the last principle that we need to look at is x-ray penetration. So the factors that are going to be determining the exposure of this x-ray film, of course, is of course the duration of exposure, the energy of the protons, even the source to image distance. But of course, these are technical terms that are going to be understood by radiologists and people studying radiology. For the clinicians, I don't think this is uh, pretty relevant for you. But the, what you really need to note is that in practice, almost all non-radiological uh, people or non-radiologists are going to be using the terms exposure and penetration wrongly. So they usually use them interchangeably, but it's not really um, precise because they usually use this to describe the contrast and the overall brightness of an image. But of course, because it's been used on so many times, most of the people tend to usually just go with that. So here is a good quality film. This is an x-ray which is too bright. This is an x-ray which has too much contrast, so it appears too dark. So if we want to use a term uh, under exposed or underpenetrated, we can use this term to apply to both an x-ray that is too bright. So if it's underpenetrated or underexposed, it means not a lot of x-rays have passed through this uh, x-ray. So it means that it's um, not exposed. So it means it's going to be appearing brighter than usual. So this is an underpenetrated or an underexposed x-ray. If a lot of x-rays have gone through, it's going to have a lot of contrast. It's going to appear much darker. So this is an overexposed or an overpenetrated x-ray. So remember that penetration, uh, exposure and penetration is very good, especially uh, because you're able to determine whether this is an actual pulmonary pathology or if these blood vessels are actually um, or these lung markings are actually normal or they are accentuated or increased. A good way to note if there is some good penetration is of course to count the outlines or follow the outlines of the vertebral bodies. They should be quite visible, especially the thoracic ones and the ones behind the heart. Then consequences of suboptimal penetration, it could lead to excessive brightness. Like for example, you can have falsely prominent pulmonary markings, like I already told you. It could lead to diminished brightness, where you have this falsely diminished pulmonary markings, or even excessive or diminished contrast, where you have uh, falsely diminished pulmonary markings, obscuring of some pulmonary nodules, even obscuring of some pneumothoraces. So here's a summary of the good qualities of an x-ray film. And this is what you must always pick out before you actually start reading into your chest x-ray. So you ensure that you check all these boxes before you actually start reading your x-ray. Even when you're asked on the words, can you start to read the x-ray, you should comment on these things first. So the first thing that you should look at is the demographics of uh, the x-ray. Are they the correct patient demographics? Because the x-ray should have a name, it should have the date that it was taken, it should have the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, and preferably the hospital that has been taken. You should note the projection that is being taken. Is is this an AP projection? Is this a PA? Is this a lateral? 
is this a decubitus uh, position, okay? And the anatomical site, is this the chest x-ray? Is it an abdominal x-ray, a pelvic x-ray, or a skull x-ray? Then, of course, there should be a marker that should be there to guide you on which side is the left, which side is the right uh, side of the x-ray. If there's no marker, that means it makes it very hard for you to read this x-ray. Like, for example, in the chest x-ray, the patient may have dextrocardia, where the heart has rotated to the other side. So you may think that the right side is the left. Meanwhile, it's opposite. So ensure that the patient is not rotated. So the patient should be in the center. So they should be well centered. You should be able to visualize the lung apices above the clavicles. You should be able to see the costal phrenic angles. You should ensure that the spinous processes are bisecting the distance from the medial ends of the clavicle and you should also you should note that there is no anatomical distortion that may be there so checking for rotation this distance here from the spinous process to the medial end of the clavicle should be equal on both sides so here's a normal chest x-ray which is very well taken so the first thing that we're checking is demographics Okay, we've checked that the demographics are there, assuming that they are there. Of course, they're not depicted here. We check uh, for the presence of the lung marking uh, or the side marking, which is, of course, this side telling us that this side of the x-ray is the left. We check for the technicality of the x-ray to see if this person is well-centered so we can see this uh Spinous processes in the medial ends of the clavicle, this distance appears to be roughly equal. So this person is well centered. Then the next thing that we're going to be checking is, of course, if this patient is taking this x-ray on full inspiration. So inadequate inspiration may lead to overdiagnosis of some pulmonary opacities or pulmonary collapse. So inadequate uh, inspiration may also show that the diaphragm is uh, elevated and uh, not lying in its actual position. So on the right side of the x-ray, you should be able to count six anterior ribs. On the left, on the right side, you should be able to carry or to count nine to 10 posterior ribs. So if we count them over here, we have the first rib, first uh, rib over there. So one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's okay. Anterior ribs, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's okay. So the, the posterior ribs are these ones which are curving in this manner. The anterior ribs are these ones which are curving in that manner. So it means that this x-ray has been taken on full inspiration. So the fifth thing is you should ensure that the scapulae are not in the lung fields. So the scapula is not in the lung fields over there. You should ensure that there is some adequate penetration. So you should be able to count at least three to four thoracic vertebra behind the heart. So if we zoom this image uh, very well. So we should be able to count these thoracic vertebrae. So one, two, and the third one over here, which you can make out there. So you should be able to see the outline of this vertebra here very well. That means that this x-ray is well penetrated and well exposed. And of course, the entire x-ray should be on the film. So you should be able to visualize the lung apices. You should be able to visualize the diaphragm. You should be able to visualize the costal phrenic angles. Then once you do this, then you are ready to read the x-ray and you have ticked the technicalities of the x-ray and you're ready to read the x-ray systematically. But just a sidebar before we conclude this lecture, sometimes you may take an x-ray on expiration. So for example, if you want to increase the sensitivity, if you're suspecting that there's a small pneumothorax, so you want to take an x-ray in inspiration where the lung is going to be, I mean expiration where the lung is going to be appearing smaller and then the pneumothorax doesn't change in volume. If there's suspected bronchial obstruction where there's air trapping, like for example, if a child has inhaled a foreign body, you take the expiration, you take the film in expiration and of course the lung volume will remain the same size um, and the obstructed air remains inflated. Okay, or well, the abstracted part remains inflated. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this review lecture video on x-rays. I hope you have really understood the principles. Stay tuned for the next uh, video that will be airing on Tuesday. If you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe as we are on the road to 1K subscribers. We should achieve that before the year ends. Tell a friend to tell a friend that it's x-ray week on the channel. We leave no one behind to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time. Bye-bye.